So, with the Treaty of Versailles, what on earth are the Germans saying to themselves to try and rationalize all the L's that they took? Less is more. And by the 1930s, what were the Nazis saying when they were fed up with that? Less is a ball. So that by the time they roll through the streets of Belgium and France, all the young women from those places are saying... I'm a whore. And what's Frank Friedmeier, protagonist of Dirty Snow, saying now that his mother runs the whorehouse that caters to the occupying Nazis, and by dint of that fact, he can have anything he wants? Yes is more. Don't worry, he's Danish. His people got occupied too. I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. So I read Jean-Paul Sartre's essay, Paris Under Occupation, shortly after reading this novel, Dirty Snow, by George Simenon. I liked the book right off the bat, but this essay really made it come alive for me in a way that I don't think it otherwise would have. Now, I should start out with the obvious problem. Sartre is French in writing specifically about Paris, uh, and Simenon is Belgian in writing about an unspecified country, though one can easily imagine it is most likely Belgium. That said, these are two pieces about occupation under Nazi Germany, and they are both almost textbook examples of the philosophy of existentialism, which I'll talk about briefly later. Part of what Sartre is doing in his essay is trying to explain like this fundamental thing in the Parisian or French psyche um, to the Americans not to excuse it or apologize for it but like try to literally impress the weight of the experience and cultural memory on us I remember back in 2014 when Patrick Modiano won the Nobel Prize in Literature, one of the things, one of the chief things that he was cited for was uncovering the life world of the occupation. And this is a guy who's winning the prize like 70 years after World War II. In fact, Modiano, I'm pretty sure, was born in either 44 or 45. So right at the tail end of the war. This is like the war and the occupation is not something he firsthand experienced, but nevertheless, it shaped him completely. He's describing apparently in his writing this kind of cultural memory of the occupation. He himself is evidence that it is a thing that is you know, transmitted and not just merely something you could only live through and only understand if you lived through it. Fair warning, I have literally read only one Patrick Modiano book. Uh, it's called Missing Person. Really interesting premise. Um, it's about a guy who closes up his, uh, like, private eye detective shop, but he is also suffering from amnesia ever since, like, um, from the years of the occupation. And so he goes on, like, a detective story of himself. Like I said, interesting premise, but ultimately it was just kind of listless in French in the way that too many French things are. Sorry, Patrick. All of that is to say, I don't want to pretend like I have more knowledge on him than I actually do, but in encountering this essay and this book, I do feel like I'm more aware of this as a thing that's culturally grappled with in the same way that like... You know, we as Americans might grapple with slavery or the atom bomb or Japanese internment camps or the Red Scare or whatever. Um, not to say that those are exactly the same, but there is like a certain cultural weight and memory to each of them. I'll read a couple passages, but I think this line from the end of Sarge's essay sets the novel's tone really well. From the beginning to the end of the war, we were unable to recognize our acts and we could not claim responsibility for their consequences. Evil was everywhere. All choices were bad. And yet, we had to choose, and we were responsible. Every one of our heartbeats plunged us deeper into a culpability which horrified us. Okay, so let's talk about the plot of this book. Frank Friedmeier is 19 years old and lives in a country, unspecified, under an occupation. His mother runs a salon, though it's actually a whorehouse, and it's placed in a large apartment building where I think up to four different women at any time are uh, working and living there. And a lot of the clientele, chiefly the clientele, is of the occupying government or of the occupying armed forces. So because of all this, Frank is about as privileged as you could be in this situation, and with that privilege comes this very callow and reckless attitude, so that by the opening of the book, he has decided that he is going to kill an occupation officer. He goes to a bar named Timo's, where he is a regular, and so is the German officer, and Frank asks to borrow his friend Cromer's knife. 
Cromer gives it to him, and Frank goes outside by a tannery wall and waits to kill him. Before the officer walks by, though, uh, one of Frank's neighbors walks by, and his name is Holst. And as he's walking by, Frank sort of, like, consciously coughs to catch Holst's attention. And so, again, it's that kind of, it's a minor thing, but it's a reckless, callow thing that now Holst will see him and be able to put him there. And by the next morning, when there is a dead German officer lying in the streets, Holst could potentially be a witness to it. The Holst passes by and goes inside, and eventually Frank kills the officer once he passes by and takes the officer's gun. This is all within the first chapter. The novel is then divided into two roughly equal parts. Um, The first part is before his arrest, and the second part is after his arrest and kind of follows the subsequent interrogation. Frank perfectly demonstrates that thing Sartre talks about, about all decisions feeling or being evil and being plunged deeper and deeper into culpability. After this murder, he seems to be constantly looking out for the next evil thing to do. Like, he's constantly doubling down on his ability to act with impunity, to to inflict cruelty on the world, almost just to prove that he can act. Um, I'll leave exactly what he does unspoiled, but it's a really grim novel. Once he is arrested and jailed in an old school room, he is sort of endlessly detained and interrogated. And his only instinct at that point is to just survive and not give up anything, not give up any information. But because of this, he doesn't really understand what he's guilty of. And not understanding your own sense of guilt is a very common feature that existentialist writers like to harp on a lot. Um, And there are a number of instances in which these types of really basic, like, freshman in college, you know, existentialist ideas are very obviously spelled out for you uh, in a way that reminds one of The Stranger by Albert Camus. But at least in this novel, a lot of those themes are borne out by who the character actually is. Whereas in The Stranger, it's more like the novel requires that the character be or transform into an existentialist philosopher. In this novel, it's a lot more organic to who the character and what his situation is. Paris was fading away and yawned hungrily under the empty sky. Withdrawn from the world, fed out of pity or on a calculated basis, it possessed no more than an abstract and symbolic existence. We looked into each other's eyes and it was as if we saw the dead. This dehumanization, this petrification of man was so intolerable that many people, in order to escape from it and to recover their future, threw themselves into the resistance. Strange future, closed off by torture, prison, or death, but which we at least produced with our own hands. But the resistance was only an individual solution, and we always knew that. In our eyes, it had above all a symbolic value. And that is why many resistors were filled with despair. They were always symbols. A symbolic rebellion in a symbolic city. Only the torture was real. Hello, Nate in post-production here. It's Sunday, October 8, and Hamas just attacked Israel yesterday. And I can't help but think of the parallels between the French resistance here, as Sartre describes, and Hamas. Hamas exists largely in a vacuum of despair for Palestinians. France and Belgium were occupied for a few years, but Palestine has been occupied for generations. Attacks like what Hamas is doing right now are only going to be symbolic at this point because they will not achieve anything on behalf of the state of Palestine. But, in keeping with the existentialist themes of this novel, when faced with no good choices, people will still make choices, even if they are hopeless and symbolic. Israel is an apartheid state. Free Palestine. So Frank, after he is arrested, does indeed go into his own symbolic rebellion that Sartre describes the French resistance as being. And the struggle for him is to make some kind of meaning that is just as real as the torture and interrogation. And it's really nice, especially in the shadow of a book like The Stranger, to have something that is way more grounded, but also probably gives the reader a way more lasting understanding of what existentialism is or feels like uh, without even necessarily like spelling it out in academic existentialist terms. And if you weren't going to call this an existential novel, you would call it a psychological novel. Uh, And to be honest, the novel doesn't use like a rich language palette. Obviously it's translated, but I think even 
in its original, it probably wasn't like the densest book ever. It's pretty straightforward and no frills, unless you count acts of cruelty and sexual violence as frills, I guess. Uh, but you can hand this to like an eighth grader, right? And they aren't going to have any issues or comprehension, I would think, on average. Um, they might have some questions about, you know, wartime prostitution, but buddy, don't we all? And even within that fairly anodyne language, you're getting an intense psychological novel. Like, it's full of tension even when, like, I personally, when I thought about what the ending would be as I was reading it, um, I didn't think it would be happy. And yet, at the same time, I found myself almost rooting just page by page for Frank to just keep existing. You know, I'm in that struggle with Frank in the second half where I just want him to last another page. Just last another page. Put all your will into lasting another page, another day. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, I really think you should read Paris Under Occupation if you read this novel. Uh, that essay is pretty short. It's only like 13 pages. Um, I'll put a link down below. You can, it'll be a JSTOR link, but you can sign up for a free JSTOR account, and I think you get like 100 articles a year. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment with your thoughts below if you've uh, read this book or read Sartre's uh, essay before. I do one last sort of bit of Paris occupation or occupation uh, media that I came across recently. Um, this is a lot more lighthearted, so that's why I saved it for the end. But it's a British, a 1980s British comedy called Allo Allo. Um, and it's on Amazon Prime. That's where I discovered it. And I discovered it literally like the week after I had finished reading this book. And the main guy is Rene. So it's obviously a British TV show. So it's all in English. But you've got Rene, and they're all doing French accents. And they appear to my kind of uneducated ear to be like, bad accents kind of on purpose um but you got this main guy renee he is a restaurant owner who is just kind of trying to survive day by day and make nice with all the different factions so this includes the german officers but it also separately includes the gestapo because uh the regular german kind of rank and file are scared and intimidated by the gestapo it also of course uh includes uh the french resistance british airmen the french resistance is of course like divided between de gaullists and communists and there's already like existing tension um within that even as the series is going on so there are various collaborations and compromises that he does to try and keep everything around him balanced this is all amplified by the fact that as he is french um he is having two different affairs and he's trying to keep those hidden you know from the wife and from each other but it was one of these weird kind of delightful things that i just discovered and popped up on my um, kind of recommendations and even in its own way obviously like it's playing on sort of negative but playful stereotypes of both the French and the Germans um, it, it fundamentally it finds its conflict in the same source that this essay and this book do uh, that of being compromised that of uh, that feeling of evil being everywhere and always having to be complicit in it um, so there's a last minute recommendation for you. Like I said, thanks for watching. Uh, more videos soon, probably. Maybe. Bye. Uh, so we shouldn't be all too startled to see what's going on in Israel, which is quite ugly and as part of the shift of the country far to the right, which was predicted in 1967, predicted right off that a consequence of the uh, occupation would be to turn uh, the country to the right. When you have your jackboot on someone's neck, uh, it's not good for your psyche. Uh, and uh, I think we've been watching this happen.